Coming up next, a new major hurricane bears down on Florida as the long recovery from Helene continues across the southeast. We talk with Penn State students who lost contact with his family for days. Didn't know whether to be angry, whether to be sad. I, you know, part of me wanted to cry. Plus, protests here and across the nation one year after the Hamas attack on Israel. And former President Donald Trump returns to Pennsylvania and the same place where a gunman tried to kill him. The Center County Report starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Isabella Cahill. And I'm Michaela Robinson. Thank you for joining us for the Center County Report. We begin with breaking news. Hurricane Milton is barreling towards the Florida coast right now. The Category 4 storm is expected to make landfall as early as tomorrow night. Evacuations are underway along the Gulf Coast. Student meteorologist Gavin Sandell is here with us with the latest. Gavin? Thank you so much, Michaela. You're absolutely right. Hurricane Milton right now tracking in the Gulf of Mexico as a Category 4 hurricane winds at 150 miles an hour. It was a Category 5 earlier, but it has weakened. Still a crazy strong storm. Really, the only good news about this storm is that there still is time to evacuate from Florida. It is uh, scheduled to make landfall at some point Wednesday overnight as a Category 3 hurricane. Still very strong. And that's why hurricane warnings are in effect for the entirety of Florida southeast of Tallahassee. Tropical storm warnings also gracing Miami and portions up north near Jacksonville. Back to you guys. Thanks, Gavin. It wasn't even two weeks ago that another hurricane, Helene, slammed into Florida. It left a devastating mark across the southeast. Reporter Demetra Garguches talked with a Penn State student who's with one of the hardest hit areas of North Carolina. Nearly two weeks after Hurricane Helene slammed ashore in Florida, the number of dead keeps rising. It's now at least 227. Especially hard hit is North Carolina, including the mountain town of Asheville. Nearly 600 miles away in State College, college students like Dylan Molis are keeping a close eye on family and friends there. The Penn State telecommunications student is from Asheville, and he says it's been challenging. I didn't have any feelings. I didn't know. I was shocked. I was panicked. I didn't know whether to be angry, whether to be sad. I, you know, part of me wanted to cry, part of me wanted to punch a wall. I didn't know what to do. With phone lines and service down, Mollis wasn't able to reach his family and for days didn't know how they were doing. There has never been a time where I have not been able to reach my family. They're always, if I call them, they always drop everything to answer. Former FEMA Administrator Pete Gaynor says it's hard to imagine the toll the storm took on North Carolina. There are, there are no infrastructure left in some of these communities, so no water, no telecommunications, uh, no power. And so it's going to be a monumental effort in some of these communities to kind of get some of the basic necessities back, like being able to talk on your phone. Fortunately, Molas eventually got the news that his family is safe and their home is still standing. I'm glad that I'm safe, but at the same time, I, I kind of wanted to be back there because people I love are suffering and the town that I love is suffering. And, you know, I want to suffer with them. Asheville continues to face critical challenges as it works to recover from the hurricane's impact. In State College, I'm Demetra Gerguchis for the Center County Report. Helene is the deadliest hurricane to hit the U.S. mainland since Katrina in 2005. Events in State College by Jewish and pro-Palestinian groups marks yesterday one year of the Hamas attacks on Israel. Grace Eckerly reports. We charge you with genocide! We charge you with genocide! In downtown State College, a pro-Palestinian rally marked the one-year anniversary of the Hamas attacks on Israel. Protesters marched through the streets as police blocked roads to traffic. It's important to start um, fighting for changes on campus, such as the demilitarization of Penn State, um, the divestment from companies who have stake in Israel, just similarly to the end of apartheid in South Africa. Forty-one thousand Palestinians have been killed since the Israel counter-assault began in Gaza. On the one-year anniversary of Hamas's attack on Israel, pro-Palestine supporters have taken over the streets of State College. At Penn State's Old Main, Jewish students and community members held their own event, 
marking the attack that killed 1,200 Israelis a year ago on October 7. I've learned about the Holocaust in history class and about Germans that were afraid to say anything. And I think somebody in America needs to speak up for the Jews that have been slaughtered, um, the actual victims of October 7th. And I think their protesting on this date, the one-year anniversary, is particularly grotesque. Um, so I'm just here so somebody speaks up on behalf of the Jews. I'm not Jewish myself, but I care. Hostages remain captive in Gaza. Ryan Ettery is a Jewish Penn State grad. I think it was completely terroristic. They themselves have said that they solely exist not to free the Palestinian people from a occupation, but they said that they exist to get rid of the Jewish state. A year later, military strikes drag on not only in Gaza, but in Lebanon. And Israel has faced missile strikes directly from Iran. In State College, I'm Grace Eckerly for the Center County Report. Other memorials and protests were held across the nation and the world to mark the anniversary of the October 7th attacks. The election is just four weeks away and there are new court decisions coming in. The U.S. Supreme Court has turned away a challenge from the Republican lawmakers here in PA to a Biden administration executive order aimed at boosting voter ad registration. The Republicans said the order was an attempt to interfere in the election. The state Supreme Court has refused to step in and immediately decide issues related to mail-in ballots. With early voting already underway, the court rejected and requested by voting rights and left-leaning groups to stop counties from throwing out ballots that have a handwritten date or lack the right date. In a dramatic return to Pennsylvania, Former President Donald Trump rallied with a crowd of supporters in Butler over the weekend. It's the same spot where a gunman shot him. Gianna Brown reports. A crowd of about 24,000 people greeted former President Donald Trump as he returned to Butler for a campaign rally. It's the same spot where a gunman tried to assassinate him in July. Look at what happened. A bullet hit Trump's ear, injuring him. A firefighter killed in the crowd that day was honored during Saturday's event. In his speech, Trump talked about illegal immigration, the importance of fossil fuels in the U.S. economy, and what he said is his plan to turn the country into a manufacturing superpower again. Those who want to stop us from achieving this future have slandered me, impeached me, indicted me, tried to throw me off the ballot. Vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance was also at Saturday's rally along with Elon Musk. We will go wherever we need to get the vote out. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, wherever it's needed, the battleground states. Massachusetts is still into play. He'll go where he can get the money. That's the whole thing. And if you look at the, at the uh, license plates, a lot of those license plates were coming from Connecticut, from Florida, from New Jersey. Enhanced security was in place this time in Butler for Trump's return visit. I'm Gianna Brown for the Center County Report. Center County Report will bring you live coverage and voting results on election night, November 5th. Still to come on the Center County Report, more on the weather. We'll check the seven day forecast. Plus, a Center County running race that combines fitness with Halloween fashion. Also coming up, Pennsylvania may be closer to a big change to state hunting laws. We'll tell you what's happening. Pennsylvania is one of the few states that still doesn't allow hunting on most Sundays, but reporter Chris Reynolds says that could change soon. Pennsylvania has one of the nation's top five deer populations, with close to one and a half million white-tailed deer. They do a lot of damage, from car crashes to crop destruction. But now, there is a new effort to fight that by ending the state's 200-year-old restrictions on Sunday hunting. Game Commission Supervisor David Stainbrook doubts that removing the ban would be the best way to solve the problem. If we reduce deer numbers at that large scale, that may help uh, reduce the impacts to farmers, but we actually have better tools available to deal with the impacts for farmers on their property. Lawmakers from both parties are considering legislation to expand Sunday hunting, which is limited to just three days per year. Many farmers say it would help cut the population, which would lessen crop damage. It would also help hunters. A lot of the hunters, they work day jobs, so they can only hunt through the weekends. And if they have an extra day to hunt, they have an extra day to see deer, they have an extra day to have a shot, they have an extra day to you know, harvest that deer. New bills would leave hunting decisions to the Game Commission. Right here in State College, there are efforts being made as well. Right on the other side of those trees is Penn State's Deer Research Center. 
Penn State is working with the National Wildlife Research Center to help control the deer overpopulation issue. Additionally, this center allows research programs and they're testing vaccines and other probiotics for the deer. With less people hunting in recent years and less land to hunt on and other factors, many believe it's the right time to make moves to cut the number of deer. In State College, I'm Chris Reynolds for the Center County Report. The statewide deer season began Saturday for bow hunting and the rifle season begins November 30th. Quite the mix of sun and clouds right now as we look live from the Penn State golf courses. I'm student meteorologist Gavin Sandell. Right now here in State College, we're sitting at 61 degrees. And we're also feeling like 61, but our dew point of 43 makes it feel like a dry day. So if you haven't left your house yet, make sure to grab your chapstick. Your lips might be a little bit chapped. 61 as we go into State College and really upper 50s to lower 60s as we go across the board across Pennsylvania. There isn't really much to talk about there. Just a very nice fall morning. Radar satellite shows not too much. There is some cloud activity moving through Clearfield and Center counties, and we could get a spotty shower today with that. There also are showers going into the Finger Lakes region of New York, and really across the country, not much to speak of with the exception of a little bit of rain down here. And it isn't just a little bit of rain. This is Hurricane Milton, which is currently bringing all of its outer reading bands to Florida. I talked about this earlier, but it's a category four hurricane winds at 150 miles an hour. It was as strong as an 180 mile an hour category five, which was the strongest hurricane in the Atlantic basin since 2017, a pressure at 929 millibars. And residents in Florida should really be aware about this. It has about a day and a half until it makes landfall somewhere in the central region of the Gulf Coast of Florida near Tampa. That's where the middle of the cone of uncertainty is. The thing that we all want to watch is hurricane warnings and tropical storm warnings. Tampa right in the bullseye of that hurricane warning, really stretching across the, a lot of the length of Florida. Tropical storm warnings as well are very much highlighted in blue, going from Miami all the way up to Jacksonville. Really anywhere in southeast of Tallahassee is under a certain tropical alert. So let's look at the afternoon forecast here for State College. A nice fall day, contrary to what they're seeing in Florida. Our high should be in about the mid-60s. 63 is what we're saying at 4 p.m. And it'll cool down as we go into tonight. Cool enough that we'll get mainly clear conditions and maybe a low of about 41. Cooler as we go into the mountains, maybe some scattered frost in there. And I do want to mention the fall foliage report. The PADCNR released this on the 2nd. And I do want to show you guys um, with forecasts coming up for the next seven days will really make these leaves not just start to change, but we might get into some peak action. Let's look at the future cast. Those northerly winds bringing down the weather uh, is going to really bring us some nice cool conditions going into Thursday, Friday, and also the lack of clouds. The clouds that act like a space heater or a blanket are going to make our conditions beautiful. So let's look at the seven-day forecast. 60s as we go into Tuesday, Wednesday. 50s maybe on Thursday. But heading into the weekend for our game against USC on Saturday, it's going to look nice. So I'm a lover of fall foliage. It is the weekend for that. I do, too. It's my favorite part of State College when the leaves fall to the ground. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. Being from New England, I love seeing the foliage. So I'm excited for it to come here. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's head over to Jack Kiefer in sports. Next in sports, baseball in October. The Phillies resume their playoff series in New York. An unbeaten Penn State gets ready for its longest road trip of the year. We look back at a win against another West Coast team coming up next on the Center County Report. I'm Jack Kiefer with Sports. Penn State football is heading to California this weekend after a successful stripe out against UCLA. The Nittany Lions are up to number four in the rankings. Hannah Valcourt is live at Beaver Stadium with more on Saturday's win. Hannah? Jack, Penn State has played their last four games here in Beaver Stadium. They won't return for the next four weeks. They go to USC unbeaten and confident. On a spectacular sunny stripe out day, Penn State hosted new Big Ten opponent UCLA. It was the first time the teams have met since 1968. Both teams started slowly and the first quarter ended in a scoreless tie. Drew Aller got it going with a one-yard rushing touchdown to put the Lions on top. On the next drive, the Bruins tried to answer Penn State's offense 
by driving into the red zone. But two defensive plays by deny Dennis Sutton forced UCLA to settle for a field goal. Coach James Franklin praised his defense following the win. Our defense, a couple things to kind of jump out about them. I think our third quarter defense all year has been, been ridiculous. UCLA had negative nine yards in the entire third quarter, thanks to the Nittany Lions suffocating defense. Overall, the defense has allowed 87 yards on 46 plays in every third quarter this season. That's 1.9 yards per play. Defense has held Big Ten opponents under 100 yards rushing in four straight games in 15 of the last 16 games. UCLA finally scored a touchdown with 16 seconds left to play. Penn State won this one 27 to 11. Penn State is 5-0 for the fourth straight season in a row. This is the first time a team in the country since 2021 has done that. And the first time in Penn State history this has been completed. Penn State now heads across the country to California to take on USC on Saturday. Following that game at USC on Saturday, Penn State will go into another bye week. Live from Beaver Stadium, I'm Hannah Valcourt. Thanks, Hannah. Kickoff for Saturday's game is at 3.30 p.m., and you can listen live to the game on Penn State's Com Radio with our team in Los Angeles. Now to high school football. Harrisburg shut out Altoona 33-0 on Friday night. Penn State commit Messiah Mickens had not one, not two, but three touchdowns as the Cougars moved to 6-1 and one on the season. And the State College Little Lions hosted Cedarcliff. After the whistle reporter, Eric Morse has more on that game. This game started off like a dream for the Little Lions. They jumped out to a 14-0 lead in the first quarter. Eddie Corkery and Ty Salazar stuck the pedal to the floor, and gas was cheap. I have no idea how many yards they had, but um, I know it was a lot. Um, it, you know, but th those two are just uh, they're special kids, uh, great young men, and, and kids that really represent our program well. The State College Little Lions offense made its way to the end zone in just a split second. A long ball touchdown gave the team the lead just four minutes into the game. And the show, yeah, it was only getting started. I don't want to say it too loud, but he has not been sacked in a year and a half. Um, so ever as a starting quarterback. So, um, it, you know, that's a, a pretty, that's a tribute to the guys up front. A combination of explosive plays and a steady ground game that added two touchdowns of its own led the State College offense all night. We want to shove these guys in the dirt as hard as we possibly can. That's our attitude every single week. We had to come out and show us like who we are. We like to run the ball. We play smash mouth football up front. State College's defense also secured multiple takeaways en route to a dominant performance. If you were looking for a complete game tonight, you found it here at Memorial Field. You can see highlights from the top, top local games every Friday night on After the Whistle. That's at 11.30 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Penn State hockey opened the new season with a sweep in Alaska. Newly named captain Simon Mack scored the game-winning goal in overtime on Saturday, and the Nittany Lions won 5-0 the following night. Penn State takes on number 8th ring Quinnipiac this weekend on the road. Penn State volleyball is now 4-1 after sweeping Oregon in the team's wear-white match. Jess Murzik led the Nittany Lions on Friday night with 16 kills, including three straight in the first set. Her final kill ultimately sealed Oregon's fate in the third set. The Nittany Lions hit the road this week to play Michigan State on Friday. Both Penn State soccer teams had a busy couple days at Jeffrey Field. Last night, the men's team took on Rutgers. The Nittany Lions won 2-1, scoring on a penalty kick in the final 30 seconds. They also played on Friday night in the Wear White match against UCLA. The Lions were down 2-0 in the first half, but two goals in the second half secured a 2-2 draw. The women's team on, took on Rutgers on Friday. Caitlin McBean scored in the first five minutes of the game. She is now responsible for 40% of her team's goals. That match ended in a 1-1 draw. The Penn, Penn State is ranked 19th and will face Maryland on Thursday. Now to playoff baseball. The Phillies are back in action later today as their series with the Mets moves to New York. The Phillies showed fight in game two as Nick Cassianos delivered a walk-off single in the ninth inning to secure the win. 
Now with the series tied, the Phillies look ahead to Game 3. Veteran Aaron Nola will be on the mound. That's all for sports. Now back to Isabella and Michaela at the desk. Thanks, Jack. I am so excited for this USC game this weekend. I have really high hopes for us. I'm not really a sports girl, but I do love myself some Penn State sports. Thanks. Coming up, coming up next, we'll take you to the local 5K race that brought the community together for a spooky afternoon of fun and competition. As we head toward Halloween, a local 5K race held an annual tradition over the weekend. It combines fitness with fun costumes. Reporter Declan Stablo has more on the event. On your mark, get set, go. Bold City Brewing in Boldsburg hosted its second annual Oktoberfest 5K with about 120 runners hitting the trail. But the event was as much about community as competition. Brewery owner Gordy Kaufman says it's been a long time dream to host an event like this. It was always important to me to have events like this, which are community events, but I also wanted to have athletes participate uh, at the brewery, and I wanted to have an annual event uh, that was really special, and so the key thing there was just choosing the right time of year. And what better time for a brewery than Oktoberfest? Sean Fallon, a Penn State parent from Connecticut, says he plans on coming down again next year. I was down for the big football game yesterday, and I'm a runner, and I'm like, oh, how cool is this? There's going to be a race the next day after the big, the big game. And uh, it never hurts to kind of burn off all that uh, tailgating food that I ate yesterday. Although the main goal today was to bring the Bullsburg community together, there was still a race to be run and won. Just under 20 minutes after the starting gun, Cody Love crossed the finish line. Cody and his wife Molly started the Trails and Ales Run Club, which meets here every week. We have a close relationship with Gordy, one of the owners here, um, and this is something that he had stated he'd been wanting to do for a long time, and so when this you know, came about, uh, this being the second year, I knew it was something that I wanted to be a part of and take part in, so it's been nice to sort of engage with the community like this. Although Love ran most of the race by himself, his number one fan made sure he had help on the final stretch. Are you going to race when you get older? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Are you going to win? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> in Bullsburg, I'm Declan Stablo with the Center County Report. Participation was up about 20% from last year's race, and they hope to do the race again next year. That's all for today's newscast. We hope you'll join us next Friday for our next no local news update. And you can follow us anytime for breaking news on our Center County Report X, and you can see our stories on our Facebook page, Instagram, YouTube, and our website. Have a good night.